Hello, everyone. We're, we're, we're getting the scoop on, uh, on Allison and Nico here. So. No, my favorite thing is, is, is Nico. That, you know, he, well, their whole family loves Aristotle. And Aristotle wrote a book that's called The Nicomachean Ethics, or sometimes it's pronounced Nicomachean, but he pronounces it The Nicomachean Ethics. His name is Nico. So. No, we always remember that. And, uh, gosh, it's amazing. Guys are all grown up. So, Allison, that's wild. He's, he's, he's nursing school, right? Nico? He's nursing school, okay. Is she still doing pre law? Uh, she is, right? She's still doing pre law, right? That's what she is. Whoa, what was that all about? Hmm. That was loud, but that scares me. I hope it's not messing up. Hopefully, you're all still there. Okay. Now, even though most of you are, you know, majoring or minoring in humanities, I want to send you that information because you can share it with other people. You can send it on to your uh, fellow freshman honors college students. Uh, and again, what what I did is uh, I put the whole. I wrote a whole essay. It's about six pages about it. But then I, you know, cut out this one small one like this. Uh, and that's where you can see I was clever. I, I I used a little piece of tape to put it in there so it all fit on one page. Uh, but this is the relevant. In um, but anyway, spread the word. We need more majors and minors. And again, it, it really is true that the schools, you know, that businesses are looking for people in humanities that have the creative skills, the critical thinking skills, that think outside the box. They they can make connections between things. I mean, it's all good stuff. And like I said, you, you only need six classes to get a minor in English. I think it's. Yeah, I think I think history is probably the same. Eighteen hours usually. It's pretty typical. It's just six classes, and you can do it. It's good for the soul. It's good for the soul. Okay, uh, we were ready. Um, we had just finished uh, the Ode to the West Wind, and now we're going to move to Shelley's poem to a skylark. It's on page eight forty nine. To a skylark, and we're going to see some similarity, right, in in both of these poems. Shelley, who wants to be the poet prophet, is going to want to channel the power of the west wind or the skylark. The difference is, is that the west wind is also an orchic energy, right? If winter comes, can spring be far behind? Well, it brings death and life both. But whereas the skylark is not really an orchic energy, it's more a pure kind of energy. And every romantic is going to write at least one poem about birds. Why do you think poet, romantic poets would like birds? Think about it. It's just freedom, right? They're, they're free, they soar above things, and of course they do what? They sing, right? And, uh, and you know, some birds don't sing and fly at the same time. The skylark does. It can sing and soar at the same time. And again, if you think about a romantic poet, why does a bird sing? It just sings, right? In other words, a bird is a poet who sings poems while being completely un what? Unself-conscious, okay? You want the bird that just sings a pure song. They, they, maybe they sing when they're happy or sad, but it's just a pure song spontaneously bubbles out of them. And that's what the romantics want, that kind of a song right? that comes out. And look at the beginning, this wonderful, Hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert, that from heaven or near it pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Wow. Unpremeditated art. Spontaneous and unmediated. By the way, uh, when we did Dejection Ode at the beginning of the last class, remember I told you how he has that long six-beat line at the end? It's four, 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 and six. Uh, you know, um, uh, how, how, su uh, how sweet... How sweet did any person share my uh, whatever I can't remember. But here, notice it's another six beat line in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. And this time, instead of having you know four beat lines, a bunch of them, and then a six, we have three three. Hail to thee, blight spirit, bird that never worked, that from heaven or near it. So it's three 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 six. But how does this six foot line? sound totally different than the six-foot line in Dejection and Ode. In Dejection and Ode, how did that long line sound? Well, Moses just sounds like two lines together, right? Okay, good. 
Yeah, yeah it's, it's building up. up. And what, what is the feeling of it? That the long line in dejection ode, how does it feel? What's the mood of that? Those long lines. Heavy, good, heavy, melancholy, pressing. How does it feel here? In profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Yeah, yeah you're taking off. Yeah, Isn't that amazing? He can take the same long line and give it a totally different feel. Here, it's even better, though, because 3, 3, 3, 3, 6 is like you're winding up the spring why, and then letting it soar. Right? And that's just what he's kind of... Because really, um, Abigail, you're right, that you could, you could change the uh, indentation here and make it 6, 6, 6, right? Uh, but it doesn't. Then it would be the devil. Um, but, the, uh, but the but here again, and, and of course you get that rhyme scheme A B A B B. Um, it's again turning and turning and turning and then soaring. Right? Uh, again, it's amazing how she, again this this is a stanza form he invented, and as far as I know, never used again. It's purposely done for this poem and captures that feeling. Okay, hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert. Throughout the poem, he's wondering, is this a bird or what? Like a spirit, like a fairy or something. He keeps wondering, is it, can it be that this... And you need to understand that throughout this poem, he doesn't see the bird. It's so far, far up, he doesn't see it, he only hears it. It's an unbodied sound, which is the ideal for romantics, right? It's a completely pure sound, isn't weighed down to earth in any way. So, Blythe, there's actually a famous play by Noel Coward called Blythe Spirit. It's a ghost story, but it's, have you seen it? Or heard about it? They made a pretty good movie. Rex Harrison is in the movie. It's an old movie. You'll probably enjoy it. They bring, bring back, his wife dies and they bring back the ghost and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's fun. Um, but, uh, again, from heaven or near it, 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 it seems like this bird soars all the way to heaven. That's how, obviously not literally, but it, it's almost like a, a, a golden shower of music is pouring out from heaven. He does, he's no longer singing hymns, singing deaf hymns at heaven's gate. If you don't know that wonderful Shakespeare a sonnet that begins, uh, when it... When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries. But then when he thinks on the beloved, haply I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark at break of day, arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. Shelley certainly has that sonnet in mind. Here, though, we start with the joy of this, this, this lark that not only seems to be able to fly to heaven, seems to be bringing music down from heaven. And again, profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Try to fit a unpremeditated, a six-syllable uh, word into your poetry and make it scan properly. And that's pretty wild stuff, okay? That's pretty neat. Higher still and higher, up, up, up. From, from the earth, earth thou springest, like, like a cloud of fire, the blue deep thou wingest, and singing still dost soar, and soaring ever singest. Isn't that the lightest line that you feel drawn up on it, like you had wings yourself that could soar to it? It sings and soars, it soars and sings. Again, a lot of birds only sing when they're perched on a tree. They don't sing. It's just like, you know, the ad you can't walk and chew gum at the same time. The old joke, right? Here, a lot of birds can't do that. They can't, but this one does. It sings and soars at the same time. Uh, by the way, something springing up from the earth out of a cloud of fire. Does that sound like something from mythology or legend? And, uh, and bird? Okay, we got bird. Flying up out of fire from the earth? Yeah, the phoenix, right? Every so often it burns itself and then out of the ashes rises a new phoenix. It's definitely the imagery of the phoenix here. Scorning the earth. He uses that phrase later in the poem. Okay, now look at the next three stanzas. Just look at the last line of the next three stanzas and see what they have in common. Like an unbodied joy whose race is just begun. Thou art unseen, but yet I hear thy shrill delight. Until we hardly see, we feel that it is there. What do they all have in common? We're commenting on something very common uh, together here that's, again, important for romantics. What is it about this sound? Yeah, you can't see it? Good. You see, it's something you don't see, but you hear. Remember, 
in, in the, 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 the dejection of a Coleridge or even a Wordsworth is when I can when I can see it, but I can't feel it. Like, that's the worst. Here's the best. I can feel it or hear it and not see it. That's much better. Much better to feel without seeing than to see without feeling. Right? For a romantic poet who can experience abstinent abstin pleasures as if they were present. Wonderful stuff. Uh, so, again, it, it's, it's really the ideal. It's, just, it's escape the body and every kind of heaviness that comes with the body, and it is just a pure song. Right? He, he, he doesn't see, but he feels. Uh, and, then and then look at the next one. The moon rains out her beams, and heaven is overflowed. I love that image, right? What, 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 what does Jesus say? But I come that you might have life and have it abundantly or to the fullest, right? Have it life abundantly, John 10. Um, wonderful. Okay, now, there's a, a kind of a break. There, there isn't literally a break here. But in the next stanza, he starts to do something different. He says... What, what thou art we know not, what, what is most like, like thee, from rainbow clouds there flow not drops so bright to see, as from thy presence showers a rain of melody. Wow. For the next several stanzas, he's going to try to come up with what? This is something that poets do all the time. They try to come up with a what? Just the right image okay and specifically here we're thinking simile because what is it like is that simple but for the next several stanzas we're going to ask that question what is like the what is there anything in the regular known world that is a simile that can be used as an analogy or an image of who you are and we're going to see that a lot of these images have something in common right but so the, but that's the question that's going to keep coming back right um i love that rainbow clouds are flow not drop so bright to see uh, it's a wonderful imagery, right? right? It's, it's a, a rain of, of melody. It overflows, it overwhelms, it lifts up. Okay, okay. Like, like a poet, poet hidden in the light of thought, thought singing hymns unbidden till the world is wrought to sympathy, sympathy with, with hopes and fears, fears it heeded not. Now, I love this. The, 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 the skylark is like a poet, but the poet is what? Like a poet? He did. Right? Nobody sees the poet. You see how there's an odd mixture here? And, and it's, it's, it's a doubly romantic thing. The poet is isolated or in seclusion, not seen, and yet the poet has what impact on the world? Good. And it moves them. Good. It moves them to, to, to feelings we never felt before, to new experiences, to new emotions, new things like that. But it's interesting that we don't see the poet standing in front of a crowd at Speaker's Corner and moving everybody. I got to actually... Good. It's like, you, know, you can't see it, but you can hear it. Right? And the hearing produces feelings. Whatever. Um, and I say that because you're going to see that all, all the following similes are also going to be of something that is hidden. Something that has an impact, but is invisible to the eye. It's not seen. It's kind of weird. It's like, so, okay, we might become the poet prophet, and the world is moved, but you're still not part of the world. Now, this is not as dark as the Byronic hero, but there's always a little element of it, right? That you're not part of it, but you move it, right? Maybe, you know, so it's a little less angsty, but still, it's weird. It's almost like it can't be part of society. It wants to move society, but it can't be, right? Uh, what is it? That's the way it has to be sometimes, right? Someone has to suffer so that others can enjoy it. We set out to save. That's not for me, right? It is for you. You'll be the governor, right? And, uh, and then I, I, in the book, he goes on to say something like that. It's, that's how it always is. Someone has to suffer, lose it, so that others can have it. Something a little, I got it exactly, because it's done on the movie. Uh, Good. You can't go in. And you're right. That's kind of an experience thing. You can't go back to the farm. And so, and actually, if you think about it, Frodo, like the ancient mariner, sees things of great, great beauty and great, great horror both because of being a ring bearer and whatnot. Amazing stuff. Lord of the Rings filled with Byronic heroes. Anyway, uh, Frodo isn't really about. Well, he's got elements of it. He, he's redeemed. Yeah. 
That's what I mean. That's what I mean. So he's not. He feels the weight. You know, Gollum is the weight. Gollum is what he could have become. That's the Byronic hero. I mean, see, that, that's what's weird about the Byronic hero. So that that um, that uh, in some ways, what's that guy's name? Um, Count of Monte Cristo. Okay. In some ways, he's a Byronic hero, but he is redeemed at the end. Right? I mean, he still is up until the end, and then he is redeemed. Uh, and I, I always love books like the Count of Monte Cristo, where uh, you know, at, at the end you say, I've put aside my wrath. Well, of course you killed everybody! Of course it's easy to put aside your wrath, you killed everybody. Uh, but the... Uh, yeah, it's kind of easy. But I mean, so, so there are... Another example of that is, in one sense... Uh, Raskolnikov is very much a Byronic hero in *Private Punishment*, but he is redeemed. So there's a, it's a little, and again, you, you get, and even to that extent, I mean, Darth Vader is the ultimate Byronic hero, but he is redeemed at the very end. Uh, but he still is up until that point. Okay, so there's possibility. Whereas something like Ahab is not redeemed. Certainly, Heathcliff is not redeemed. But but uh, Ra Rochester is, but like in the last sentence of the book. You know what I mean? So the very end of it. But there's a hope of redemption at the end. I was going to say, so it's okay, like if you think about that, as we talked about Urban after he killed everybody, maybe he's, he thinks he's stopping at justice and not being excessive. Well, that's interesting. I mean, you can always carry on and never put aside your wrath. So, I mean, it is a good ending. I'm stopping at doing justice and I won't be excessive. Because that's the thing for Monte Cristo, is he doesn't then punish like. The the, the that is true, as opposed to Heathcliff, as opposed to Heathcliff, yeah. That's true, so you're right, there is some, you know, you know even, even, even somebody like, uh, uh, like Jean Valjean, I mean, he's, he's an odd one, because in a way, almost society has made him a Byronic hero, uh, and yet, you know, there is, and I think that's, yeah, I think that's unique to the movie version of the musical, where everybody comes, where the, like, where the bishop shows up, at the very end, have you seen the movie version of the musical? At the very, by the way, I saw it finally. Cats, man, it really is as dull as they say. It's just dull. It goes on forever. Have you seen it? Yeah, I'm not talking about the show, but the movie, which was a famous bomb. You heard about it? It really creeped everybody out too. It's very creepy. Yeah, that was really weird. I, I just kind of looked away, and you know. It got a little better at the end, but it was Ian. It should because that's the same people that made Lame Miz made that the movie of made Lame Miz made Cats. All the same people. Well, but he made the King's Speech. King's Speech was good. Hmm. Maybe that's it. Yeah. Oh, oh right. See. Really? I guess that does help. Yes. Good luck. Wow. Crazy stuff. So, so now, now look at look at another one. Like, like a high-born high maiden, maiden in a palace, palace tower. tower. We we want to call her what? Rapunzel, Rapunzel right? We want to call her. Oh, well, Prince or anything, but Rapunzel. Although, although, if you've ever read the Lady of Shalott, by Tennyson, Tennyson. make you think of that too. Like, like a high-born high maiden in a palace tower, soothing her love-laden soul and secret hour with music sweet as love, which overflows her bower. You see, she's locked up, hidden away, doesn't have her love, and yet her song, you know, uh, rejuvenates everybody else and hears her. It is, I guess it's true. It is the song. That is true. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. That is fun. Are we going to get a sequel to Tangled? We probably don't need a sequel, but that was a fun one. Yeah. Yeah, I hope they just leave it alone, right? The, uh, but, but again, still isolated, still cut off, but your song helps society. Right? Like a glowworm golden in a dell of dew, scattering unbeholding. So it's not seen, but... It, you know, We've all seen fireflies. Do they have fireflies here? I've never seen a firefly. We have some. Yeah, you don't see them very much here. I guess, that, yeah. They, oh. <laughs> but here, I mean, have you ever seen like glow worms? Oh, there are some that are longer, but I mean, it's the same idea. It's glowing, right? Uh, but again, it's unbeholden. Nobody sees it, but it scatters it. It's aerial hue among the flowers and grass which screen it from the view. So he's, you know, 
Yeah, yeah that, that's the way it is. It's good to put it. Yeah, you're, you're seeing it, and it's it's illuminating the grass that is actually hiding the bug away from people, right? like a rose embowered in its own green leaves. This could be the, the girls of the Jones family. I don't know. <laughs> like a rose embowered, keeping away in its own green leaves by warm winds deflowered till the scent it gives makes faint with too much sweet. Those, those heavy winged thieves. Here, the flower is giving all of herself. And, you know, the, the word deflowered is also used of, you know, uh, of a version. I mean, so it's, she's giving everything of herself as it's being taken away. That better not be the Jones girl. Um, but uh, <laughs> deflowered away. And again, it takes it away, right? So, and, okay, now. Um, okay, we're going to stop. Uh, he almost could have put a little, you know, break here. Because what's he going to start doing in the next dance? It changes again. Sound of vernal showers on the twinkling grass, rain awakened flower. Oh, I'm sorry, one more. All that ever was joyous and clear and fresh, thy music doth surpass. So, this is sort of a transition. He just piles things on us. All, all these things could not, all of these things cannot surpass the song of the bird. Whether it's vernal showers, twinkling grass, rain awakened flower, all of that. Everything that is joyous, clear, and fresh still surpassed. Then he does, okay, because. You surpass everything, O oh bird. Then he's got another question. Teach us, sprite or bird, still not sure which. What sweet thoughts are thine? I have never heard praise of love or wine that panted forth a flood of rapture so divine. So we've asked, what is like the Skylark? Now what are we asking? What could possibly be the what of your song? The origin. The origin. What is the origin? What is the source? What is the inspiration? What could possibly inspire such a song and he gives an example it seems like some of the original like lyric poetry was written about one of two things and they're listed there look at the stanza there what are the two things that people have written songs about okay love or wine okay they still write songs about love maybe not as much but a lot of the original songs we have from ancient greece the lyrics are, are drinking songs wine songs Oh, do people have, people write poems to beer? Oh, I, you know, it's true. I didn't think about that. I, I guess it still is. That's true. Yeah, it's still true, true about that, isn't it? The, uh, that's what you wrote. Okay. Yeah, Margarita Feld. Yes. My boyfriend made me Is it, is it getting you nervous, ladies? Because guys like to do that. They, we like to test you with like a somebody. Although Maria's the option, you probably test your boys. They better like the, uh, your weird movies and songs. So you, I, you probably test the boys, but but a lot of guys do that. They like test the girls, and you, and you got to be careful. You got to like it, or maybe all over. You know? Yes, and he did write some drinking songs, right? And, and drink, drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will drink with thine, right? And have you ever learned to sing that? That, that was a song that was often set to music. Oh, that's right, that's right, yes. Drink to me only. But a lot, like I said, a lot of the earliest poems, fragments that we have uh, from, you know, like before the golden age of Greece uh, were about wine. So this is what we're drinking to, right? So love, wait, what's it? That's right, yes, both of them do, right? Love and wine. So I don't know. One warms up for the other sometimes. But anyway, um, that pant of rapture so divine. I've never heard. I mean, the best love and drinking songs I've heard don't come close. Isn't there a drinking song in Sleeping Beauty? Drink, drink, clink. Isn't there a... Nobody seen Sleeping Beauty in a while? You've never seen Sleeping Beauty? My daughter's favorite. That's it. You haven't seen it. You have to see it. Yeah, it oddly has not that many songs. Yeah, that's scary. Yeah, that, that, that kind of ruined it for you, you know. Yeah, it's really funny. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 you mean oh, yeah, in the cartoon too? Yeah, see, it's, it's scary. Yeah. Oh yeah, that then the dragon comes in. Yes, he's one of the great villains. Watch out. Well, she does. Maybe in some ways. She gets you. She gets you. 
cursing the poor little baby girl. <laughs> so anyway, okay, here, here are some other things that we write songs about. Chorus, hymn and nail, or triumphal chant. You know what chorus, you know what, um, well, if you don't know what the hymen is, I'm not going to tell you, okay? Uh, but it comes from the, the god of marriage is called hymen. That's, that's where that word comes from, the maiden hymn, right? So, so I, marriage songs, marriage songs and triumphal chants. When, when, when do you sing a song? When do you get a triumph? If you're an ancient Roman, you literally get a triumph when you do what? Win a victory, right? So in other words, songs about marriage and songs about war. These are two other things that people, you know, sing about. Uh, match with thine would be all but an empty vaunt, a thing wherein we feel there is some hidden want. Again, they, they, can't, they can't get close. These are great songs, but there's still something missing. Even the greatest wedding march. What's the most famous wedding march? Da, 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 or well, actually, the better wedding march is da 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 da. da, da, da. You know where that's from? Very good, very good. It's it's the wedding of yes, Decius and Hippolyta, which is what bookends the the play. Uh, and uh, no, no, I, I'm sorry, we're, we're changing. I, I changed it. The actual wedding march da 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 is from Wagner, and it's about a, a forced marriage. So I don't know why anybody plays that. Because I think the girl's being forced to marry the guy. In the, in the, in the, it's an opera by Wagner. Yeah, Midsummer Night Dream is the is the. Yeah, well, but but it's called that 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 actual song is called the uh, wedding. I think it's called the wedding march of. I'll have to look at it again. Huh. I'll have to look at it again. You might be right. I could have swore I've seen that. Oh, da, 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 da. It is beautiful. I'll have, to, I'll have to look that up again. Okay, that's, that's kind of funny. But at least that one's a little bit better. So neither one of them is very good then, I guess. I don't know. Just go with Pachelbel's canon. That's better. Anyway. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah. That's why right. my daughter, she's, she's got to walk up to the, you know, da 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 Oh, that's true. That's pretty. Oh, my gosh. That's really weird. Are you afraid of them, too? No. Oh, you just love them? Okay, that's interesting. So, so you, you were more afraid of Maleficent than the dragon. Of course, the dragon was Maleficent, baby. <laughs> you like you like dinosaurs? Yeah, fun. Anyway, anyway, come, come back, come back, come back. Okay, so, um, what? Uh, and then now we ask very specifically: What objects are the fountains of thy happy strain? So, what's the source? What's the fountain? Uh, what what is it that could inspire this? What fields or waves or mountains? What shapes of sky or plain? So they. Maybe it's what? If you're going to put that together in one phrase, what is it that might be the object or source? What fields or waves or mountains, what shapes of sky or plain? Could it be the beauty of nature? Yeah, you know, these are, is it the beauty of nature that makes you sing this song? Could it be what love of thine own kind? What would we call that? What would be a good word for that? I guess we're not supposed to be this anymore. It's politically incorrect. But patriotism, okay? Patriotism. What love of that own kind? What ignorance of pain? Maybe it's just your health. <laughs> Maybe it's your health that bubbles up out of joy. Maybe it's patriotism. Maybe it's the beauty of nature, right? With thy clear, keen joyance, languor cannot be. Right? Languor is kind of like torpid, right? Languid. Right? Uh, there, there can be no heaviness, no going down. Shadow of annoyance never came near thee. Wouldn't you like a life where shadow of annoyance never came near you? You know, like I said, we, we still live in a good country where we're more often annoyed than actually oppressed. But annoyance does build up, doesn't it? Okay. That's it? It is, a constant annoyance. Oh, it's very nice people who are never annoyed. Maybe. It does, it does. It's both character. I think that's part of maybe the heaven that we seem to be nightmare. Probably our life will have no shadow. That's what you get, right. No shadow, yeah. No shadow of turning in the... Oh. Thou, thou lovest, but ne'er knew love's sad satiety. Okay, this is kind of a, uh, But you kind of know the words. You think, what does it mean to be satiated? Okay? Satisfied, full. Like, like you're really, really thirsty and you drink a lot of water and you're satiated now. But here, thou lovest, but ne'er knew love's sad satiety. 
what he's saying is that you have found a love that's ever pure and never gets satisfied and full. So to me, it's like saying a perpetual honeymoon. You're always on your honeymoon. It's always pure. It's always new. It's always fresh. It's never old hat. You're never, it's always being new and fresh without being used up. Right? Without, without the coal fading away, maybe, to use the Shelley thing. Uh, now, we're going to get to Keats in a moment. And with Keats, I'm going to use a phrase a lot because it gets to the heart of Keats. And the phrase is process in stasis. Now, why is that should be an oxymoron, process and stasis? What do they mean? Good continual developing, you know, growing. Move. So th- those are opposites. But to me, heaven must be a place of process and stasis. Why do I say that? If we're in heaven, we do certainly have to be in a state of what? Well, I mean, in some ways, if we're in heaven, we should be in a state of perfection. Right? But if we were just in a static state of perfection, that doesn't seem like heaven. There seems to need to be growth. So we're obviously perfect now. We're in God's presence. We, it seems that we will no longer be able to sin. Um, that's kind of hard to imagine, but it certainly seems that we will no longer be able to sin. In heaven, we'll be in a state of perfection, but certainly there's growth. Great, and they're trying to define the difference between greatness oh, and excellence. Okay. And I have no idea if this is at any rate correct. But what we eventually said was that greatness was like you were you were doing well at something, you were succeeding at it, and then excellence was continually. Oh, that's great. good. So then you would never be excellent, and you could never say something was excellent because it had to continue being excellent to be excellent. So I guess it's kind of like that. Maybe? It is hard, but but but. The weird thing is that, but of course, if you were trying to live like that, you'd be ever anxious and never satisfied. To actually say, I've reached the state of perfection and yet I'm still growing, that, that's, that's, I mean, like I said, to, to me, that, that's, that's the heavenly ideal. But what I'm saying is that too often, did any of you ever grow up with what you might call a static vision of heaven? We're all in heaven, like that, frozen, right? Certainly, heaven must be a dynamic place. There must be continual growth, but. We have to be in perfection because we're now in God's presence. You know, we're in God's holy presence. And so we're perfect, but we got to keep... They, Lewis uses the image of going to the mountains in the Great Divorce, where you're on the horse and you're going higher and higher, further up and further in. You were going to say something, Maria? Is that what you were going to say? Further up and further in. Theosis, okay, yeah. Becoming more like God. Div- divinization, becoming like God. God became like us so we could become like Him, which is wonderful. That's the, so you still got enough... Are you still Orthodox? You still haven't decided. Baptist, Baptist, is that even Anglican? No, no, no. Oh, okay. It's cute. You're like the poor little orphan girl. I love it. It's like, can somebody take me to church? <laughs> I love it. It's just one. Hey, you can walk over to College Park where I go, or University Park. <laughs> well, that's Baptist, too. Oh, oh, yeah, that's true. I guess, yeah, you don't have to leave. But you want the embodied experience. Huh? That's cool stuff. <laughs> so, okay, so, again, process of stasis is you're static and perfect, but you're still dynamic and you're still growing. So here, perpetual honeymoon, ever fresh, ever new, on and on. Wonderful stuff, right? Uh, um, waking or asleep... Thou of death must deem things more true and deep than we mortals dream, or how could thy notes flow in such a crystal stream? Man, you've got to know something that we don't know. What, 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 you must know something about what? What, what, what does, uh, what does uh, Hamlet say to Horatio? There are more things... There are dreamt of in your philosophy. Right? You must know something more about death. Right? right, something that I guess maybe would take away the sting of death or something. But you, you seem to know something that we mortals are, are ignorant of. Otherwise, how can your notes just keep flowing out seemingly without any dark note, just pure rain of melody? And then, I love this stanza because it's a perfect expression of over self consciousness. Think about this. We, human beings, we look before and after and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thoughts. Is that the human condition? 
What, what is, is the human condition? Oh, I like that. Oh, Lord of the Rings, right? We look backwards with what? Regret. We look forwards. With anxiety. Are you, are you answering me or giving us your life right now? You, just, you really got that well. It's like, I know it. I know it. And, and, and why can't we live in the now, right? We, we're always, the, the implication is that the bird is living now in the song, living in the song, pure. And that's on us, back and forth. We're always pining for what we do not have. Right? Um, there was an old, what was that old, uh, <laughs> that old Nat King Cole song? He begins by, as a rule, man's a fool. When it's hot, he wants it cool. When it's cool, he wants it hot. Always wanting what is not. <laughs> Great? That's the beginning of the song. Uh, what is it? Uh, uh, well, uh, um, wild is love, bitter but also. Uh, I think it's wild is love. It's a Nat King Cole song. I've never heard anybody else sing it. And he puts that little thing in the beginning that's really cool. <laughs> I love that. He speaks it. Um, that's what they say. You know, Nat King Cole could like sing the, 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 the uh, phone book and make it interesting. Hey, do any of you know what a phone book is? We haven't seen one. You still see it? Okay, I'm sure. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Oh. Oh, oh, there we go. It's going to be used anymore. Now, did, did, did you ever grow up in, in a church where they, they showed you the, these cool Christian guys that are called the... What are they? Anyway, they're like these guys that were bodybuilders. And they become Christians, and they, they, they're, 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 they're like the Freedom League. And they'll like take... Um, phone books and rip them in half with their bare hands or put chains and they'll break the chains. These are like really tough guys. <laughs> yeah. Power team. They're called the power team. One of them. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> It's like why? I mean, it's. I mean, I mean, the idea is breaking the chains of the devil. So it's kind of cool. But I think I was. Ah. <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. Okay, so so look at this. And do you ever feel this way? And actually, we said this already uh, when we were talking about Blake. What's wonderful about the laughter of children? is it's a pure laughter. So often as we get older, our laughter, there's always a tinge of regret or maybe somebody's going to hear me or what. Why? Have you ever felt this way? Like you're having a great day and then something goes wrong at the end. It's like, Lord, can I have one good day, just like one perfect day? It's just like seems you can't have one. Maybe, I, I, you know, probably the Christian answer is that then we wouldn't be yearning for heaven, okay? Uh, and we, we'd get too comfortable, right? C.S. Lewis says that our world is not a house, it's an inn. It's a way station. Right? We're on the road, and sometimes he gives us, you know, a wonderful little respite, like Pilgrim's Progress. Right? There's always way stations. It's the same thing for Lord of the Rings. There's always a homely house somewhere to visit, but then you have to move on and move on. You know, like. it's, it's life. It's a metaphor for life. Um, our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thoughts. Is that true? Why, why, are, why, you know, why are, are people's most romantic love stories like Romeo and Juliet? Or West Side Story, which is based on Romeo and Juliet. And, 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 you know, it's like something about that sadness, you know? And, uh, what, what, everybody, uh, okay, are any of you girls like huge fans of that guy, uh, The Notebook? Yeah. Because it seems, I've seen, I haven't read the books, but I've read most of the movies. And most of the movies are like happy, but then they're sad. Like, like somebody dies or whatever, but you're, 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 you'll always remember it the rest of your life or something like that. John Green. John, oh, okay. John Green is the guy who wrote The Fault in Our Stars. And we oh, oh yes, yes, okay. Again, I saw that movie. Yeah, that's right. Oh, you didn't like it? I mean, it was quirky. <laughs> this person's more miserable than I am. There we go. Sometimes that helps too, you know? Anyway. So he says, so he goes on, uh, yet, yet, if we could scorn hate and pride and fear, if we could get rid of it, if we were things born not to shed a tear, 
I know not how thy joy we ever should come near. Even if we could throw off the, the pride and the, the lust and the pain and all these sorrows, still I don't think we could capture the lightness and joy of your song. Better than all measures. Measures is an old way of saying, like when you, the old poetry that had a rhyme scheme and a meter to it, those are the measures, right? Better than all the measures. You remember, uh, are you a fan of... Uh, I'm thinking of measure for measure, but... Uh, are you a fan of, of uh, Cyrano de Bergerac? He gets, he gets his measures, then he makes up his poem. And as I end the refrain, thrust home. You don't even know that? I would think you'd like that. Anyway, uh, there are a couple movie versions of it in the play, of course. Anyway, uh, better than all measures of delightful sound, better than all treasures that in books are found, thy skill to poet were, thou scorner of the ground. Right? That's it. You scorn the ground and you soar. Remember I told you that the word mundane comes from mundo, right? I mean, really, ultimately Latin, but of the earth, mundane. It soars above all things that are mundane. It can't be held down. If we had, if, if the poet had your skill. So this is, again, it, it is inspiration as the poet prophet. It's just a little less dark than, than the, the, the west wind, which is more orchic. But it's still, I want this. Teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know. I love not thy mind, but that thy brain must know. Such harmonious madness from my lips would flow. The world should listen then as I am listening now. So it ends very much like the Ode to the West Wind. If I could channel this energy, this spirit, this joy, I would be a poet prophet, the world would listen. As I'm listening to you captivated, the whole world would be captivated by my song, right? Uh, it would have to listen. It's harmonious madness. I, I almost imagine him becoming a Pentecostal here. <laughs> it's almost like he's speaking in tongues, right? The harmonious madness of Pentecost or something like that. Uh, the, the holy laughter and all of that stuff. But he, he's still yearning for that. I need to get a little bit of that energy, that fuel. That is interesting. Oh, that is, oh, you know, like you said, I mean, off rhymes are there all the time. But you're right. That that I mean, the fact that it could have meaning, as I am listening now. Yeah. So maybe again, it's not something that you know. It's something that you experience now. I mean, I think that's possible, because you're right, no would be a perfect rhyme. Uh, although he's already used the word no uh, in the beginning, but... Yeah. It is odd. You're right. I mean, like I said, I mean, uh, off rhymes are acceptable, but it is odd to end it that way. You know, just like when, you know, Shakespeare, you know, tends to end a scene with a rhyming couplet, and usually it's a solid rhyming couplet in the change to the scene. Uh, oh, the, the time is out of joint, oh, curse it, spite. Than ever I was born to set it right. Usually the answer is going to be Hamlet. That's the f good first guess, right? You, you're going to guess Hamlet, you're going to guess Paradise Lost in the Bible, you're going to be right most of the time. Okay? But the, uh, you, you learn about that? that uh, what was it, like 50 new words were added to the dictionary by that, by that play? He like invented, and a lot of times that invention means like you know making it an adjective or something. But a lot of these new things just came out of that. It's unbelievable, it's overpouring. Yeah, yeah. I, that's one of the things I love so much about Shakespeare. He's so expressive that he had to create words yeah. to express himself, adjust them. It's great. Yeah, you're right. Making language. I mean, he is. He's, 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 and language really gets set after Shakespeare. Now, part of it is because of the printing press too. But you know, language does sort of set in, and it is still. I mean, yes, it's older English, but you know. He understood. It's like King James. He understood. You know, as a child, you'd want to make up a word, and you're like, we'll make up a word, and it'll mean this. But what is it? And it'll sound like this, but what does it mean? It's, it's hard to find something that you need to give a name to. That yeah, that's true. Have oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, you want to name new things. You know what the word, the fa fancy word for that is, for like a, a new word that you make up? It's called a neologism. Have you seen that? Neologos, right? It's a new word, a neologism. Cool. Then if you had your own language, did any of the cook kids have their own language? I think I could see that. <laughs> what about the Joneses? You have your own, you have your own languages? I mean... Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right, let's look at... On first looking into Chapman's Homer, page 953.
Keats, I'm first looking in the Chapman Tober. Keats, you know, the sonnet's an amazing form, right? It's such a tight form. You would think after Shakespeare, you're finished. But every people keep coming along and reinventing it. Uh, Milton wrote a whole bunch of brilliant sonnets. Then along comes Wordsworth had a lot of good ones, particularly Shelley. Keats has some of the best. And, and they continue on up, right? Uh, uh, into the modern period, you still see sonnets. It's amazing how people use Oh, really? Huh. <laughs> what I like about Keats is a lot of his sonnets are about the experience of great literature. Right? You know, what did Keats believe? I think he was just mostly confused in terms of, of Christianity. If he, if he, if he, he was just pretty confused. If he worshipped anything, it was Apollo. Okay, I think, and any modern person came close. Not that he was a pagan per se, but you know, I mean, it was the ancient Greece that he just loved, right? And he writes poems about the impact that great art has upon us when we first step into it, right? And he captures it perfectly in these great sonnets. Now, this is called. He had written. He had read Homer before, but Chapman actually. Chapman, if you read it now, is a little bit old-fashioned too. It's actually a pretty old. Uh, and it's in couplets too, but whatever. When he read Chapman, it was it was a little more modernized. That like you know like uh, what's his name? Uh, Pope is a great great poet, but you know his Iliad and Odyssey is you know doesn't move because you know he uses those really really tight heroic couplets, and it's a it's a work of art and beauty on its own, but it doesn't feel like Homer. Let's just put it that way. Um, that's it. Yeah, I know Homer didn't rhyme. That's what I mean. But you know that, that they, they you know remember uh, when. Uh, when, when Milton wrote Paradise Lost, he's like, epic should not rhyme. And he's not, he's not uh, being lazy, because he wrote a lot of rhyming poetry that's really good. I mean, like his sonnets and stuff. So he, he could rhyme when he wanted to. It wasn't laziness. It's just he felt no. And it's true. They, he, but the divine, that's what changes it, right? Because uh, Iliad, Odyssey, and Aeneid, they don't rhyme. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Dante does. That was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't rhyme. They, they had meter, but they didn't rhyme. But a lot of, you know, a lot of people, you know, over over the times have translated into rhyming couplets, which again is really not what it sounds like. But anyway, uh, basically, the idea was for the first time he read most of it like in one sitting and a little bit more fluid translation, and it's the first time he experienced it. And he doesn't say whether he's reading the Iliad or the Odyssey, but the fact that he uses nautical metaphors. Uh, about uh, islands and stuff suggests yeah, that he's reading uh, uh, the Odyssey. I don't, I don't know, but this again, this this captures perfectly. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western isles have I been that bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his demean, yet did I never breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman sing out loud and bold, and felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak at Darien. That's really good. Okay, now, it, this, is, this is what we call Petrarchan, so it breaks into eight and six. The first thing is, is the experience. And I love what he's doing. He's creating his own metaphor, as if you're driving, you're floating through these islands, right? And each island is a poet, or the works of a poet. So, so like, like each island, island represents, represents that. And, and Apollo, Apollo is the overlord. You Do you know what metaphor we're using here? What uh, political structure we're using here? It's from the Middle Ages. Feudalism, very good. It, the image is feudal, literally a feudalism. And that's where the phrase bards and fealty to Apollo hold. Fealty comes from that word fief, the fief of land, right? Where where you'd, you'd, uh, you'd put your hands uh, and, 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 and the... Um, the uh, the Lord would put his hands around you and you would pledge fealty. And you would get 
a thief, a piece of land, and then you're, you know what you had to do? You had to be willing at any time to raise men, knights, to fight. And so here, we've come, but here, instead of a political feudalism, it's an aesthetic one, where Apollo is the, is a, in a sense, holy Roman emperor that's over everything, and each one is an individual fiefdom, right? Now, he'd always heard before that Homer's island was particularly big. Right? It was huge, but he never really experienced it. Never did I breathe its pure, never did he take it in fully until he read it now. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. Just suddenly something happened, and for the first time, you, like you never got a Shakespeare play, and then for whatever reason, you, you heard Maria uh, reciting it, and then suddenly it, it came alive. It's like, oh my gosh. Now I understand why everybody is so big about this. Or a certain movie, maybe a movie you just couldn't get into when you were a kid. Uh, maybe it was just too above you. you know, and then suddenly you went like, oh my gosh, this really is about life. Now I understand why. Oh, oh, I can't believe that. I know you love that movie. It is a good movie. Yeah, you've got, you got to be at a certain stage of life sometimes to just kind of get it or you've, you've had enough experiences and then this movie just, wow. Right? And uh, this is a good thing. It was a book, yeah. You're not gonna get it. It's like watching it's like watching Hunchback when you're a kid and like, what is that fire song about? Like, uh, it, it, it's not gonna mean, you know, they, they, the guy that's being tempted. Is fire is that what it's called? Is it? Hellfire. Hellfire Hellfire, is that the name of the show? Yeah, fire. Yeah. But but I mean it's like if, if a kid understood that as a little kid, it's like, I'd be kind of scared. <laughs> How can you possibly understand this, right? Uh, this is weird. It's like, again, what was, Dis what was the audience Disney was shooting for? I don't know. Anyway. No, that's kind of the opposite, because then when you grow up and you get it, you're like, oh, that's worse. It's like, oh, that, that's scary. But, but it, it's, you know, again, it's, it's, but it, it's a song that gets to the very heart of what uh, Phariseeism, in a way, right? You hate the very thing that tempts you and project it onto other people. I mean, it, it actually is incredibly insightful, even from a Christian point of view. And oddly enough, that song has the most Christian song that Disney ever wrote, and that's uh, God Help the Outcast. She's just singing to the Virgin Mary. I mean, it's a beautiful uh, Christian song. Uh, and she even says to the Virgin Mary, weren't you once an outcast too? Right? And, it, you know, it's so beautiful. Um, so it's, it's a strange one. But good. Um, okay, then, okay, when we get to the sestet, this the second half, now we're going to talk about what it was like. He's going to try to get the right meta, and he gives us two. Then, then felt, felt I, I like some watcher of the skies. skies. What, what do you call those people? Simply astronomers. Okay. When imagine you're an astronomer and you're looking through your telescope and suddenly you discover what a new planet. Eureka! 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 Eureka right? It's it's Pluto and it is a planet. Whatever you you discover something and suddenly you've discovered it was always there, right? But you suddenly discover it's become it's become part of your universe. Or, then the second one's longer, like, like Scout Cortez, when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific, and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak and daring. You know where daring is? Okay, this is the first European to see the Pacific Ocean, right? at least from that side. Right? And uh, where, where, where is the narrowest part of Latin America that you can see? It's the narrowest part, and that's why they built something there. Panama Canal. Okay, so Darien is in Panama. So now this is the most famous mistake in all of British poetry, because it was not Cortez who did that. You know what it was? You might have read that note, but it's Balboa. So this is like the most famous mistake. But it's okay; it didn't work. Uh, it, it, we don't mind because this is this is poetry, right? Um, yeah, poor Balboa wouldn't fit it. Which just wouldn't work, right? But. Imagine when they, you know, it's called the Pacific Ocean because if, even though all the Californians like to have, you know, go in the waves, Pacific means calm. And I guess the first time they, they saw it, it must have been very calm and stretching on forever and they called it the Pacific Ocean. Uh, even though there's all sorts of things that happen around the Pacific Ocean. But imagine they're caught in a breathless moment of awe. Just, okay. You know what this is like? Have you ever gone to a church that has a crying room? You know what that means? where there's like a glass wall and behind the glass is the mom with the screaming kids and if you ever cast a glance back this is what you see like a frozen scream it's like, oh i can't hear the kids it's like having a mute button and your kids right uh and but that's what it is it's like a frozen it's just you're, you're like okay let's put it this way if you're a, a singer or a violinist or something and you perform 
after you finish performing, do you want silence to fall over the audience or a hush to fall over the audience? A hush. A hush. So you know what the difference is? We're getting them, you know, fine shades of meaning. I mean, it could be silent because everyone's falling asleep. Okay? But what does a hush mean? It's silent because... They're holding their breath. And that happens sometimes. It's like so amazing that there's a moment when you just... You, you, can't, you can't even make a sound. So it, 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 it's even better than a, than a, a flawed because everybody's caught in a moment. This is what he's trying to capture, that, you know, that, that sense of awe. And you can link it to process and stasis because it's like, it's a frozen moment. It's, okay, it's not suspended animation. You know what that is? Suspended animation. Uh, when I was a kid, everybody thought that Walt Disney was in cryogenic freeze. You ever heard that rumor? Uh, is it still around? I don't know. No, man, you, you, and you understand why? Why do you put someone in cryogenic freeze? But why? In other words, because they're dying of something we can't cure. But if you put them in freeze, maybe a hundred years from now, they can cure it. They can unthaw you and cure you of the disease. I don't think they've done that. But that, that was the concept. That I never, I never forget. I read this wonderful, really short story where this guy has done it, and he wakes up, and it's like two hundred years later. And, 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 the, and the doctor says, this is great. I'm so happy to tell you your cancer's cured. You're fine. Right? He's all oh, happy. And then the guy sneezes. And the doctor says, what's that? Oh, it's nothing. Why, why did you sneeze? It's nothing. It's, it's just a common cold. And the doctor takes out a syringe and kills him. Because in the future, they have, they have solved uh, cancer, but they haven't co solved the, the, the common goal. They solved it by eliminating completely. <laughs> the guy gets killed. That was a wonderful you know, a little trick ending to the story, right? Because we can't really, you know... Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I don't think it's funny, but that, that's the idea. You, you just can't do it, right? So, science. Look at the next one. This is this one's even stranger. On seeing the Elgin marbles, actually, I think it's yeah, Elgin is the way it's pronounced. Uh, does anybody know where the Elgin marbles are and what they are? Okay. <laughs> okay. Has anybody ever been to the British Museum? Oh, okay. Did you see the Elgin marbles? Okay, it's a huge room. And all the way around the room, on all four sides, are these marbles, what they call low-relief friezes, that were originally on the Parthenon, right? And when you go in, you're surrounded by them. It's, it's the moment my, my son and I spent forever. The, the, the ladies walk on, and we're like, we're, no, we're spending two hours in this room. because It, it is unbelievable. I mean, you're, you're, you're there. And it's cool, because in the original Parthenon, they were all along the outside. So what they did is they flipped it, and now they're all along the inside of the room, so you're surrounded by them. Oh, it's wonderful. And anyway, the, uh, the Greeks still want them back. In fact, the Greeks have built a new Acropolis museum, and there's a room that's empty. And people are like, what? why is this room empty? We're waiting for the British to give us back. <laughs> it's a great propaganda piece, you know. And even though I am a Greek, you know, it's like, if they hadn't taken them, they probably would have fallen apart. But anyway... And like, you, know, you understand the funny thing about London? Maybe you learned this, Maria. London is a place where the museums are free, but you have to pay to go into the churches. Often that's true. Many of the museums are free, but some of the churches you have to pay to go in. Unless you can sneak in during even song, so you can go free. Uh, but yeah, they, they charge you to go into St. Paul's or Westminster. <laughs> I know, it's weird. Yeah, it's weird. You used to live in London. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I love that place. I don't remember doing that, really. Who's that? Oh. Oh, that's right. I remember that. Then, then there's my daughter when she was a kid who liked reading those Kingdom Hearts books by Disney where they're like inside Disney World and all the monsters come alive or something like that. I don't know. They read them when they were kids. Anyway. That's how we learned the name of the, of the demon in Fantasia. You know what it's called? The demon in Fantasia. You know when they've got the uh, Night on Bald Mountain? The demon's name is Chernabog. He appears. You've never seen Fantasia? 
Oh my gosh, you got to see that. Disney's Fantasia. My sister went with her friend to watch kind of a live where they do the music for Fantasia while they show the movie. Oh, that's neat. And watch Casablanca for the first time. Oh. I mean, I love Casablanca, but you can watch it anytime, you know, but I love it. It used to be that you called my home, you know, the old days when you had an a, a answering machine that was a cassette, and it, it would click up and you'd hear, you know, from the movie, uh, you, know, you must remember this, the kisses, and it sings a little bit, and then I come in and I say, of all, was it, of all the answering machines and all the homes in all the world, you got to call mine. Well, I guess neither one of our stories is very funny, but if you tell me yours, I'll pass it on to Louis, uh, Louis Marcos, that is. If not, we'll always have Houston. Here's talking to you, kid, and then the music comes out. That was pretty cool. My father used to hate, this is a minute long, you're costing me money, you know. You say that, but it was very cool. It was very cool. Anyway. So, here. I know, I know, I know. I, 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 this is great. I, I, I did that. It was, it was just good stuff. Anyway, so. So, oh, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> let, let, let's do one more. Uh, oh gosh, there's too many. I want to do, let, let, let's skip this and do La Belle Dame. Because I, I want to I, I do that one and I want to save the next class for just the two odes so we can really dig into those. And, uh, okay, so it, it's, I'm sorry, it's on page 972, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, um, which means the lovely lady without mercy, right? And this is done in the form of a medieval ballad, La Belle Dame, it's 972. And it starts, the first three stanzas is the poet, whether it's Keats or not, but the poet is addressing the knight. Man, why do you look so awful, buddy? And then the rest of the poem is the knight telling his very sad story. And this is one of the most beautiful, haunting poems that, that, that Keats wrote. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge is withered from the lake. And no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee, knight, at arms so haggard and so woe begone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest done. I see a lily on thy brow with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast withereth too. Can you tell me anything about that last line of each stanza? Do you feel it? You feel what's happening in that last line of each stanza? You see how the, the last line of each stanza is really short? Now, all the other lines have four beats and only has two. So, oh, what can ail the night at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge is withered from the lake, and no birds sing. That's just boom. That was it? A cutting down. It's 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 a. It is. It, it's abrupt. It's it's a. It's a. It's an amputation. Dare we say castration? Because the the knight is left impotent in a sort of spiritual way at the end of this. But it's a cutting. Right. It's 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 a, and it, and you feel it because normally a, a ballad would be, in terms of beats, it would be four three four three. There are some that are four 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 three, but nobody does four 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 two. And it just boom. It it just like something was promising and it's been cut off. There's a disjunction there. Uh, if I know, it's good. It's, it's cut off, and you, you can't. Something's been lost. But again, it's going to be more internal than, than external here, as we're going to see. Um, again, it's late, late August, right? The squirrel has its nuts, right? The granary is full. Everybody's ready with their stores for winter, except the night. He's empty. He has no stores. He's not going to survive. It's late August. Maybe it's uh, December, November or December. It's very, very late autumn now. Uh, not late August, late autumn. Uh, and, and, and all. And he, and he sees the, 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 the night with anguish moist and fever dew. That, that is so Keatsian. Keatsian always, the passion is there. And of course, he died of tuberculosis at age 25. I mean, so and he, he always suffered. There was always that fever flush. And, and, and always, you know, yearning and desiring and, and you know, poor kid, un unlike Shelley and, and Byron who got whatever they wanted, uh, whoever they wanted, boy or girl, uh, Keats could never get the girl. He was in love with a girl named Fanny Braun. It made a, a, actually a, a not bad movie called Bright Star, if you look for it. And it's about Keats and you know, his love of Fanny Braun. It, it's pretty well done. It's worth watching. Um, what's that? Like Frankenstein? 
Oh, yeah, okay, it's different. That's what I said. I was telling though, this is what I, went, what I meant about I felt a little less censorious to Frankenstein. Wasn't that weird the way they killed Justine? What they did is that when the monster killed William and then framed Justine, the townspeople see it, and before the Frankensteins can stop them, the whole family, they lynch her, they, they take her up and they, oh, oh, it's kind of scary, but at least it takes, you know, a little guilt off the of frame. There's literally nothing he can do. He's trying to stop it. Uh, so that's what I mean. It'll take a little bit of guilt off of him, but it's a powerful scene. It was. It really was. My friend, I watched the movie with me. And then after I came back from class on Tuesday, I was talking about class. Did you tell your professor you watched it? Oh, there we go. That's good. That's cool. But the, uh, so again, so now he's going to tell his story. I met a lady in the meads, full, beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. This strange nature girl, a nature boy, nature girl, this nature child. And again, it, it's taking place in, in, in fairy, right? Fairy, as, as, as Tolkien reminds us, are the perilous realms. Yeah, in a, in a way, you're right. Kind of dancing in the mead and all that sort of stuff. I made a garland for her head, you know, like a wreath of flowers, and bracelets too, and fragrant zone. That's a fancy word for a belt, like a belt of flowers. Um, she looked at me as she did love and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy song. Did you see that the, the, the speaker's completely focused on this fairy magic, right? She found me roots of relish sweet, and honey wild, and manna dew, and sure in language strange, she said, I love thee true. All strange, mystical foods. Is it real? Is it happening? Is it not? All this stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, it kind of reminds me of in the silver chair with Lillian and the green lady. Oh, that's kind of interesting, yeah, luring you in. Yes. And she is. She, in a way, she's going to prove to be a female ironic here. In that sense. The vampire, the vampire. It was particularly the part where he's like obsessed with her, sort of. Right. And that's just like consuming. Yeah, and then you're right. It all consumes. So every and it and it's it's. Have you ever heard? I don't think it's really true, but have you ever heard the phrase? It's dangerous to wake up a sleepwalker. I don't know if that really does affect them. They they say that. I don't know if anybody knows if it's really true, but you know when they're so focused on something, don't wake them up, or you, you might kill them. You might, he is. He's so focused on this. And, and we'll see what happens in a second. So he says, She took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore. And there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses full. It's almost as if she's crying because of what? Does she maybe feel the sorrow of... See? Yeah, of what she's going to do, right? It's like, I remember I told you, I, I think it was this class, right? I, I'm not really bad, I'm just drawn that way. It's Jessica Rabbit, right? Uh, maybe, maybe she, she doesn't, she just doesn't. Uh, uh, what, what is it that, that she sings? Uh, men, men cluster to me like moths around a flame, and if their wings burn, I know I'm not to blame. Probably haven't seen the Blue Angel, but you see that. Um, so, all that, and then, and then, and then we're getting, and there she lulled me asleep, and there I dreamed, ah, woe betide, the latest dream I ever dreamed on the cold hillside. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, Maria Louise, look at the enthrall. Sorry, I couldn't really This is the fairy child. If, 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 if you weren't here, it was going to be Eliana Wilhelm at the enthrall. But anyway, you had the longest names I could think of. <laughs> Maria Louisa sounds better, but it's not Maria Louisa. I always want to say Maria Louisa. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. Yes, your Anna. It's wild. Anyway. Um, okay. So falls asleep, and all these men who've been destroyed. By Maria. All these men that have been destroyed out there. Okay. Um, wow. I love that image of pale warriors, death pale. Were they all? I saw their starved lips in the gloom, with horrid warning gaped wide, and I awoke and found me here, on the cold hillside. And this is why I sojourn here alone and palely loitering, though the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. Notice it comes full circle. Okay, but what's the difference? I've talked about that thing that comes full circle but ends up on a higher level. How's this circle different? We've, we, we're back. I mean, it's almost exactly a repetition of the first stanza. But are we on a higher level? 
You see, we're frozen, we're stagnant. What this poem needs is a 13th stand. I mean, 12 is a good number, okay? But if 1 is January and 12 is December, then you're stuck. Right? In a weird way, 13 would be a happy thing because it would take you out of the cycle that you're stuck in and allow you to move on beyond. Sort of like uh, what's called the eighth day. You know what the eighth day is? Uh, the very the original baptistries had eight sides. Anybody been to Rome to see it? The original baptistry had eight sides. What's the eighth day? Okay. Uh, uh, again, a lot of people think uh, Monday's the first day of the week, but of course Sunday's the first day of the week, right? So uh, Sabbath, is, but the resurrection took us out of the week and pushed us into the eighth day. So the Sunday is it's the first day, but it's the eighth day because it's moved us into something new. So eight had that. Connotation. So, I mean, we don't see it as much today, but I remember seeing that original baptistry uh, that has eight sides because it's suggesting that the new life, the breaking out of the, the week into the new day. Right? He doesn't break out. He's stuck. Now, what has she done to him? In a sense, she's not done anything. He just woke up and she's gone. Right? It's, the destruction is internal. Once again, externalization of the internal with a vengeance, we can call it a little bit like that. He's dead inside, and now the world around him is dead. Don't worry, Maria doesn't do this to young men. I don't want to give you bad press. Okay. The, uh, and, <laughs> and this is why I sojourn here. So, again, he, he's... Again, it's like dejection and ode. Uh, he's, or like, remember Dante, the beginning of, of Dante's Divine Comedy? He wakes to find himself lost in a dark wood. Now, that has a happy end. He moves out of it. But here, this night is stuck and will never move out. Now, I'm going to send you a, an email, but I, I decided to make it a little bit easier. Um, remember I told you I'm going to give you either Intimations Ode or Chinchurn Abbey or... Uh, expostulation or reply. I decided to drop expostulation or reply because that was a long time ago. So this way you can really focus on just like the last three weeks. Okay, so I'll give you one from either Tintern Abbey or Intimations Ode. Then I'll give you one. We only read three uh, Coleridge poems. One of those three, and then one of the three Dejection or Ode. And now I'm oh, sorry. One of the three key. One of the three. Cole Ridges or one of the three Shelleys, and then I'm going to drop LaBelle since we did it so fast, and the last one will be either uh, Ode to a Nightingale or Ode to a Girl. So that should be hopefully fresh in your mind, okay? Uh, so that'll help you because I know you guys are going to have that study group. Everybody join the study group. It'll be fun. Uh, and focus, remember, focus. So now there's only three, six, ten poems. Focus on the ten poems, but remember, you need to know all of the thematic structure of things, right? Like if I gave you we look before and after and pine for what is not. What theme are you going to talk about? Being overly self-conscious, right? And how we, we, we're always stuck and we can't. We're, we're in a world of experience. We can't have the pure laugh. That kind of stuff is what I mean. That Make sure you've studied the themes, but then focus on those poems. Did, do you have any quick questions about the test? I mean, it's not until next Thursday, but because uh, you're, you're going to study. Anybody going to join? Did you get, a, you get a few people to join? Yay.